Let me express my thanks to the uh, audience for taking your time to attend this wonderful migration conference. It is my honor to present the next speaker and let me say that uh, I really enjoyed uh, the presentation by uh, Dr. Barnes. Today's speaker that I have the pleasure of introducing is Dr. Story Matkin Run. The title that she will be presenting is African Americans, Arkansas, and Other Great Migration, 1865. 1920. She's currently president of the Arkansas Historical Association and also serves as state coordinator for National History Day. She is an associate professor of history at University of Central Arkansas, where she teaches a number of courses. Among those courses are uh, Arkansas, uh, Southern uh, History, civil rights history, and Arkansas history. Uh, she received her PhD in history from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Her, uh, one of her great works that I enjoyed was The Great Negro State of the Country, Arkansas's Reconstruction and Other Great Migration. Uh, this article appears in Arkansas Historic Quarterly of 2013. She's won the ballot the uh, Gingles uh, Prize, and currently is working on a book, a manuscript is titled, A New Country, an African-American History of the South's Last Frontier from 1865 to 1840. Please join me in welcoming our speaker, Dr. Story Mackinron. Thank you, Dr. Hargrove. Um, thank you to all of you who are willing to spend Saturday morning learning about this incredible history. And I've been inspired so many times as a um, somebody in the audience at Black History Commission events. And I know that I've used so much of what I've learned in my own teaching. So thank you for you know, all of the previous presenters on whose work I have built. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, and like Dr. Barnes, I have a little nervousness that I might not be able to make it all the way through. So hopefully I won't move too quickly. I want to start by sharing with you where I got interested in the history of African American migration to Arkansas, because it's not a topic that is, was came up very much in research when I was in graduate school and certainly not when I was being taught in school. And my first encounter with this history of African-American migration to Arkansas was actually in Kenneth Barnes's work. So the story I'm about to share with you comes from a story I read in his incredible book, Who Killed John Clayton? So this is the town of Edgefield, South Carolina. This is a picture taken of Edgefield just before the Civil War. And I was reading Dr. Barnes's work and I learned this story that on the day after Christmas in 1881, and this is where Edgefield, South Carolina is located, roughly 5,000 African-Americans in Edgefield packed up their belongings. Many of them had sold off everything they could and had given away to those who stayed behind um, anything they hadn't been able to sell off. And they joined a large pilgrimage to Augusta, Georgia, which was just across the state line and was the closest railroad station. Some of these families were already waiting at the station and they had chartered a train that was gonna take them to Arkansas. Now that train didn't arrive that day and we're still not sure why, but many of them were so intent on leaving that they were willing to pay a second train fare and catch a trip the following day. Um, and that train took them, most of them to Arkansas. Some of them apparently went to Texas, but the majority went to Conway County, Arkansas. And those who couldn't afford a second train fare actually began walking. 
and walked and followed wagons for 750 miles um, from South Carolina over into Arkansas. This took roughly 20% of the county's black population away in a matter of days. And it was in all of the newspapers, the New York Times, the Edgefield Courier, the Charleston News. And it was one of the major news stories of 1881 and 1882 as it crossed into the new year. So the Charleston Courier wrote, there's been nothing like this since the days of Pharaoh. So they're referencing Exodus, right? They have this common language of the flight of the Israelites out of Egypt. And the courier noted that on some plantations in Edgefield, there was not one single African-American sharecropper left. This really devalued land, it was almost impossible to sell your land in Edgefield County because there was such a serious labor shortage. And of course, it had a significant impact on the other side. In Arkansas, Conway County went from having a very small African-American population to over 40% African-American population during the 1880s. And this was just the beginning. Exodus after Exodus wave left South Carolina, largely for Arkansas in the 1880s and ended up carrying 60,000 African-Americans away from the state of South Carolina. So when I read this, I was in the middle of a lot of research on um, Arkansas in the 1960s and 70s. So I was feeling really confused because I knew the story of the great migration to the North. So if you told me about African-Americans leaving Southern states, I would have been on board. I would have thought about African-Americans moving to states like uh, Chicago, Detroit. Um, I was also aware that Arkansas had one of the largest out migration rates during the first and second great migration. So if you crunch the numbers and a historian named Donald Holly has gone through and done that statistical work, after World War I, roughly one in five African-Americans in Arkansas left every decade and only Kentucky had a higher out migration rate. So I actually went through a stage where I thought, I'm just not understanding what I'm reading. There's surely not a migration movement to Arkansas. But as I dug deeper and deeper, I found that not only was there a vibrant migration movement to Arkansas, but that there was a lot of migration in the South after the Civil War to the entire Western South. So that included states like Texas, Oklahoma, um, Louisiana, and even to some extent, the Mississippi Delta, which was considered a largely unsettled area. So some of the major African-American exodus movements that I've since come across, uh, one of the earliest that I'll be talking about today was out of the Georgia area, especially the Atlanta area and also um, Macon and uh, that Eastern Georgia, excuse me, Western Georgia region. Um, that was followed by an exodus out of Alabama, um, then an exodus out of Western Tennessee. Then you had a massive out migration from South Carolina followed by one from North Carolina. And then in 1904, when a particularly racist governor named James Vardaman was elected in Mississippi, there was a large exodus from Mississippi into Arkansas. So these are the organized exodus movements that you would read about in the newspaper where the exodus clubs are making statements and you know, organizing their train fare all together. But exoduses were also happening on a smaller scale all throughout these decades. The other big surprise for me was that this story was actually fairly well known during the early 20th century. So Carter G. Woodson, who's known as the father of black history, when he published A Century of Negro Migration, which was, it came out in 1918, is probably the most important work on African-American migration, might still be to this day. He pointed out that the first great migration that was being experienced in 1918 he said, as we know, this is not the first time that African-Americans have migrated in search of quote unquote economic opportunities. That first movement wasn't to the urban North, but to the Western South, to the states of Arkansas, Texas, Louisiana, and Oklahoma. And then the following year, 1919, Emmett J. Scott, who was basically um, 
Booker T. Washington's in-house research guru, Emmett J. Scott finished a report for the federal government on the Great Migration, and he noted that Arkansas had led the nation in attracting African-American migrants from the Civil War all the way through World War I. And as I dug in, later statistics confirmed these impressions by these historians. A demographer named William Bickery in the 1970s and 80s showed that three quarters of a million African Americans had moved to Oklahoma, Texas, Arkansas, and Louisiana after the Civil War, and that the plurality of these migrants, so the largest number of these migrants, over 200,000 had settled in Arkansas. And just to give you a sense of the impact of this migration, if you look at Arkansas census from 1900, roughly two out of every three African-American households is headed by an adult who was born outside of the state of Arkansas. So two out of three African-American households headed by an adult born outside of the state of Arkansas. To give you a sense of how dramatic that is, if you look at South Carolina in 1900, that figure is 3%. If you look at North Carolina, that figure is 7%. If you look at Mississippi, which also experienced some in migration, that figure is 23%. So we really have to think about the impact of these different African American migrants, the community cultures that they brought with them, and the motivations that drove them to Arkansas when we think about Black history in Arkansas after the Civil War. So one of the things I thought a lot about is why did we lose this history? Why did we, why do we not know that there was a great migration to Arkansas? And I think, you know, I'd be interested in knowing what you all think, but I think one of the reasons is that there's this conventional wisdom that African-Americans always saw freedom as being in the North. And what we see is that African-Americans also had a sense of possibility in moving West. Um, and you see this in great writers like Ralph Ellison, who comes out of the Oklahoma tradition, that going to the territory was an expression of freedom in this time. And so maybe we need to rethink about um, sort of a geography of freedom that's a little bit more complex than just North equals freedom, especially since African Americans found themselves barred from a lot of employment in the North following the Civil War. The other reason I think that we have trouble um, identifying this history of African-American migration to the Western South and to Arkansas is that it undermines a tendency to present American history and the history of African-Americans in American history as one of linear progress. So we all know sitting here, African-Americans migrating out to Arkansas, we know that the carefully crafted 14th and 15th amendments that guaranteed their citizenship rights that those will be undermined in Arkansas, just like they will be in Texas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, and Mississippi. We know those states are gonna pass segregation statutes and use racial terrorism and lynching, expulsion to enforce white supremacy. So it's hard for us to include in our American history narrative, one in which we see the status of African-Americans um, reverse and go backward when we want to present it as always getting better and better. I want to frame though the rest of my talk around this question of African American migration and their intent. Were African American migrants making mistakes? Were they tricked or coerced or deceived? Were they ill informed? Did they just not do their research or their homework on the Western South? And so for the rest of this talk, I want to highlight how African American Southerners viewed migration to Arkansas and what goals they had in moving to this state. So the first and certainly the least controversial motive for migrating to Arkansas among African Americans after the Civil War was economic opportunity. This is an image of Freedman's Village in Little Rock right after the Civil War. And what this image doesn't show is the incredible devastation of the Civil War on Arkansas. Historians have estimated that Arkansas's population fell by roughly 50% during the Civil War. 
due both to mortality, high mortality rates among civilians, and also people leaving, moving to Texas, Missouri, and Oklahoma. And the, that fall in population fueled a labor shortage, and the labor shortage in turn pushed up wages. If you look at federal uh, information about wages in the South following the Civil War, you see that right after the Civil War, farm workers in Arkansas typically make about twice as much as they make back East in states like Georgia, North Carolina, and South Carolina. Now that differential will fall during the late 19th century, but even in the early 1900s, African Americans in Arkansas typically made anywhere from 30 to 50% more than African Americans back East in the Southeast. And I like to tell my students, if I promised you a 50% pay increase right now, or even a 30% pay increase, I can imagine that this would make a difference in your standard of living. And I know it certainly would make a difference in my standard of living. One of the other things that's important to note here is that when African-Americans organized a big exodus like they did in Edgefield, local papers would report that wages also went up for African-Americans who stayed behind. Now, the effect didn't last forever. It would typ typically be gone in about 10 years, but migrants took note of this. And when they were organizing their exodus, one of their appeals was basically do good for yourself and do good for your brothers and sisters. You'll raise your wages by moving to Arkansas and you'll also raise the wages of people left behind because you will create a little labor shortage in the area that you're departing from. I do wanna mention um, that higher wages did not convince all African-Americans in the South that resettlement in Arkansas was wise. If we look in African-American newspapers, there's actually a really heated debate about whether or not it was even moral to move to Arkansas, even if there were higher wages there. Um, Arkansas, we now think of as the Bible Belt, but after the Civil War, Arkansas was really considered part of the West in the imagination, and it was considered a place that was quote unquote heathenish. There was very low church attendance among whites and African Americans in Arkansas after the Civil War. And um, there was a famous antebellum quip about Arkansas that every man left his honor and every woman her virtue on the banks of the Mississippi River before he or she crossed into Arkansas. So one of the concerns among a lot of African Americans was you're moving to a place where people have low morals and there's not a lot of church attendance. And of course, this was a real draw for a lot of churches, both the African Methodist Episcopal Church and the AMEZ Church and many independent and individual Baptist ministers purposely moved to Arkansas to try and bring you know, church and um, Christianity to the wild folk of Arkansas. But one of the accusations against African-Americans moving to Arkansas from African-Americans in the Carolinas in Georgia was that it was just greed. They were just chasing money and that this money would corrupt them when they got to Arkansas. And ministers in Arkansas very directly took this on in African-American religious newspapers. So um, one minister in Little Rock named John, J John Jennifer, he quoted Isaiah's prophecy and said that even the Old Testament said that every valley would be exalted. And so that it was okay to come to Arkansas and make money. Um, and he quoted the high rates of land ownership and home ownership. And that's interesting to note because they're not making this up. At the turn of the century, Arkansas slightly led the South's average in land ownership um, with about 25% of African-Americans owning land in Arkansas in 1900 versus 20% for Black Southerners generally. But in home ownership, they were actually far ahead of the curve with 30% of African-Americans owning homes in Arkansas and a much lower statistic for the South as a whole. So I do wanna say in defense of our Arkansas migrants that the wages were typically a means to an end. And the end was not just a home, it was a homestead, um, a home on enough land that you could grow food for yourself, your family, and provide for yourself and then grow cotton for the market and make cash. And I did not find this photograph, though I treasure it. When I submitted my article to the quarterly, 
one of the editorial students found this picture. This was in a pamphlet advertising railroad land in Arkansas. This is a homestead in Northeast Arkansas. You can see that they've deadened the trees. They've chopped the bark away and the trees are dead behind them. That's to clear that land eventually and um, put crops in there. But you can see here just this image of homesteaders and migration to the West is making its way even into a publication designed by white Arkansans for African-Americans and whites in the South interested in migrating to Arkansas. So homestead had a lot of meaning. Um, it was considered by most freed people across the South to be the best basis of both economic independence, um, but also a guarantee of citizenship rights. Uh, a lot of times to run for office, you needed to post a bond that could be land or money. And so it was possible to run for office by um, putting up your land as bond. And it was also a source of physical safety because African-Americans in Arkansas could settle close together and often did settle on adjoining land and help protect and defend one another from outsiders and whites who might be jealous of their success. So I don't wanna make a claim that black Arkansans were more passionate about land ownership, but it is clear that they had more opportunities. So I wanna talk for just a second about that. Um, one of the big sources of land in Arkansas was the railroad. A huge amount of Arkansas's land was actually owned by railroad companies. And once they built the railroad through the area, they were eager to get rid of that land, to sell it off so they didn't have to pay property taxes. And many of Arkansas's railroads advertised in African-American newspapers, especially religious newspapers that were distributed all throughout the South. So here you see the Southwestern Christian Advocate. That was a Methodist Episcopal newspaper for African-American parishioners, the AME Christian Recorder, um, these newspapers also often carried articles about the benefits of moving to Arkansas and even advertisements about ministers um, who, not advertisements, but letters from ministers saying we're organizing a migration to Arkansas. One thing I can't show you a picture of, I don't have a good picture of it, but there was also a Southern Homestead Act right after the Civil War. The federal government offered any quote unquote union loyal Southerner um, acreage in Arkansas, um, about 9 million acres. That's roughly one fifth of the state of Arkansas was available under the Homestead Act. Now, very quickly, African-Americans showed a preference for railroad land because it was typical closer to the railroads. And our land office in Arkansas was very disorganized. So there was a lot of trouble with land patents. But the idea of homesteading in Arkansas was an important one, and many early Black settlers after the Civil War did homestead on federal land. Here's another advertisement you can see here, you know, settle in Arkansas. Um, a, a third really interesting aspect of African American migration to Arkansas and the desire to own land is that Arkansas was one of the only states in the United States, the only one I know of, that had a deliberate government policy of promoting African-American in migration. And that was the result of African-American Republicans who organized in 1870 and lobbied the governor and said, you know, we should promote movement to Arkansas among African-Americans in other states of the South. And the governor, Powell Clayton, listened to this group and the following year, appointed William Henry Gray, the commissioner of immigration and state lands. And he immediately began to send um, African-Americans, especially to Georgia, to promote migration to Arkansas, to share information about how to homestead, how to purchase land from the railroads and the parts of Arkansas that he considered would be safest to live in. And many African-Americans, thought at first that William Henry Gray was on a fool's errand and that this was, I mean, I think even then there was an idea that seeing Arkansas as like a desirable place to live was kind of ridiculous. But you see as early as 1873 um, in, for example, uh, Frederick Douglass's newspaper, a lot of African-American politicians writing in and saying, hey, Gray might've been onto something because look what's happening. And what was happening was a massive out-migration from Georgia by 1873. 
on the part of African Americans who were fed up with racial terrorism and violence in Georgia and who publicly declared that they were ready to move to Arkansas. So a little bit of background about Georgia. Right after Reconstruction, there was incredible racial tension throughout the South. But in this era of extremes, Georgia still stood out for its racial violence. It combined exceptionally violent democratic opposition with very weak white Republican support, and that minimized gains for Black Georgians following the Civil War. In one very infamous example, a large faction of white Republicans allied with a Democratic minority and expelled 28 African-American legislators from the state legislature in 1868. These Republicans who were supposed to be part of the party of Lincoln, the party of racial equality, they said that these 28 African-Americans were ineligible for office on the basis of color. Even though African-American legislators were eventually readmitted to the General Assembly, political terrorism had forced all of Georgia's black public servants out of office by 1872. And in particular, they had an extremely violent and well-organized Klan movement. One of the politicians who had been driven out of office by 1872 was Georgia Congressman Jefferson Long. And as a result of being driven out, he decided to spend his energy organizing a campaign to take 10,000 black men from Georgia and move to Arkansas. So the idea is 10,000 black men is really saying 10,000 households. So men and the families that they were part of. Delegates to an immigration convention that he organized on January 1st of 1873 put out a resolution that was published in the major newspapers of Atlanta, New York, Chicago, and of course also Arkansas, that quote, in Georgia, Negroes are defrauded of their rights and denied the protection of the laws. Whereas in Arkansas, there are colored judges, constables, and mixed race juries. Long and his allies also emphasized Arkansas's well-known opportunities for economic advancement because of higher wages. And they also pointed out that free people had been better protected from Klan violence in Arkansas. And that was true. Arkansas was the only Southern state that had repressed Klan violence under martial law in 1873. So the promoters of the exodus also argued that Black Georgians stood a better chance of continuing political participation in Arkansas. And this prediction, as Kenneth Barnes pointed out, it could have failed because in 1874, Republicans lost control of Arkansas state government. But because Democrats saw the value in African-American in migration and the economic recovery it was bringing, um, the new Democratic governor of Arkansas continued not only to encourage African-American migration to Arkansas, but also to protect the right of African-Americans in Arkansas to vote. And interestingly, many Georgia migrants would come to play a very prominent role in that golden age of Arkansas politics that Barnes talked about in the 1880s. And if we have enough time, I can show you some of their pictures at the end of the slide. The other thing about the exodus was that it uh, enabled African Americans in Georgia to get a national audience and register their protest against racial violence and inequity in Georgia. And indeed, no less a figure than Frederick Douglass wrote an editorial about the Georgia exodus to Arkansas in his newspaper, The New National Era. He wrote, quote, by immigration, the colored man has everything to gain and nothing to lose. The losers will be those who deserve whatever deprivations follow the flight of laborers in Georgia to Arkansas. So he's predicting you're going to economically suffer Georgia because of this. And they did. The region's hardest hit by outmigration saw plummeting land values and also had to raise their wages by roughly 50%. So all of these reasons so far, I've told you higher wages, getting land, getting a home, protection from Klan violence. Those all make intuitive sense to a 21st audience. 
21st century audience. We get it. But there's one additional reason that migrants talk about over and over and over again, both in Georgia, in South Carolina, in North Carolina, that may not make sense to a modern audience at all. And that is fencing law. It took me a long time to understand what was the big deal about fencing law. You know, I read all this stuff and think, okay, I get it, I get it, I get it. But why is everyone so angry about fences? So bear with me just a second because fencing law is actually really important and has a lot to do with the stories that have been passed down in African-American families in Arkansas about migration to Arkansas. So when Georgia Democrats regained control of the legislature in 1872, they passed dozens of laws challenging customary land use. So these weren't just about fencing. They also passed laws restricting fishing and hunting in all of Georgia's majority black counties. They don't say majority black, they just list the counties and then you go in and do the research and you're like, oh, so you can't hunt and fish in a county that has a majority black population, but you can in other parts of the state. These laws were very deliberate efforts to undercut free people's ability to supplement their diet and income without having to borrow money from a landlord. They also passed in these laws much more controversial measures that allowed counties to change their fencing laws. So in the South, both by law and by long observed custom, Southern states allowed livestock, so cattle, pigs, I don't think chickens were quite such a big deal, but especially cattle and pigs, to graze on unfenced land, even if that unfenced land was privately held. This tradition was vitally important, not just to African Americans, but also to poor whites who relied on free range hogs as a kind of bank account. If they needed money, they could go out and sell a hog. If they needed, you know, literally to put bacon on the table, they could go out and slaughter a hog and smoke it. And landless farmers were able to have some capital in this way because they had as hogs that would run around. If you're from Southern Arkansas, like my husband is, you know, he can remember the notches they would have on their ear so that you would know whose hog it was that was running around. So, Georgia's 1872 laws reversed this custom by shifting the responsibility and cost of enclosure from the landowner who used to have to put a fence up around their garden if they, or their crop if they didn't want hogs or cattle in it. It shifted that responsibility and that cost to livestock owners who now had to pay to pen their animals. But it's not so much the cost of the fence that was really harmful, it's that now you have to own land in order to own livestock because no landlord is going to let you put up a fence on their land to keep your cattle or your hogs. So for most modest farmers, these free range herds of cattle or pigs, that had been the stepping stone to land ownership. And now that was actually a criminal offense to let your animals run wild. So very quickly, within just 10 years, 30 of Georgia's counties had voted to end free range practices. And the majority of these counties were African-American majority counties, but where African-Americans were disenfranchised and couldn't vote. Now, by contrast, in that same year, Arkansas had only two tiny districts that prohibited free range grazing. One was a little part of Claiborne County, which is up by Greer's Ferry. And then there was a little piece of land in Lee County in the Delta where free range was prohibited. But most of Arkansas remained free range until the 1930s. And when I was doing the research on this, it cracked me up because there were some places that stayed free range far, far longer. And my husband is from Bradley County. Bradley County was the last state, in, excuse me, the last county in the union to end free range practices. And I tease my husband that this is why dogs chase us everywhere we go in his hometown of Warren. And it really is striking that there are just a lot of animals still out ranging around. Well, that's because the area was free range until the 1980s. At least that's my theory. So also restrictions on hunting and fishing were fewer in Arkansas. And when you do see them appear in the 1880s and 1890s, they're not racially targeted. They really are, you know, 
looking at not killing does or you know other measures that really are to preserve game and not necessarily to cut African Americans out of fencing, sorry, fishing and hunting. So the importance of these free range practices has been passed down in the folklore about migration to Arkansas. It reminds me a lot of stories among Italian immigrants that you know, grandma or grandpa got off the boat at Ellis Island and expected streets to be paved with gold. And likewise, um, many older migrants would explain to their grandchildren and their great grandchildren that when they got to Arkansas, they thought there would be barbecued hogs running around with a fork stuck in their back saying, eat me, eat me, or that there would be pancakes growing on trees or ponds with um, syrup in them that you could dip the pancakes in that there would be chickens roosting on every tree and they wouldn't be afraid, they wouldn't run away from you. And what I've realized over time is that these were ways of explaining free range practices, that you could let hogs run around was essentially a form of wealth, that you could let chickens run around, that was a form of wealth. And so I think we've often taken stories that were told to children and imagined them as transcripts of why elders moved to Arkansas when they were metaphors for talking about the importance of being able to hunt and fish and run hogs and cattle in the bottom. There's actually a WPA interview in the 1930s between a white interviewer and an African-American man named William Dunwoody who had migrated in 1873 from Georgia to Arkansas. And the white interview is kind of making fun of Dunwoody and saying, so did you believe that money grew on bushes? Did you believe those lies? And Dunwoody says, um, well, when I moved to Lone Oak, squirrels, wild things, cotton, and corn were plentiful. So you see, the man told the truth when he said that money grows on bushes. So he's telling the interviewer, yeah, metaphorically, these things were true for us that we were able to make more money. Likewise, for migrants from cotton, uh, Georgia and South Carolina, where they were putting most of their income into fertilizing with guano, um, this very expensive bat feces fertilizer that they did, this was before commercial fertilizer, it was magical to just be able to throw seed on the ground and have cotton grow six feet high. Um, so, you know, that metaphorically was a really magical event after you've literally starved in order to pay for the fertilizer for your South Carolina farm. Let me make sure like I'm getting a little bit off. Okay, so this Georgia exodus in 1873 really motivated a lot of other groups in other states that were contemplating migrating to organize. And in the 1870s and through the 1880s, many Georgians who'd moved to Arkansas were writing in denominational religious newspapers, urging African-Americans to seize what they said would be a pretty brief window of opportunity to buy land at low cost in Arkansas. They were saying, this won't last. The railroads are trying to sell off all the land right now. Quick, come while you can and buy this cheap land in Arkansas. But as always, there were many African Americans who were really worried about the continuation of migration to Arkansas. So as movements organized in Alabama in 1874, then in South Carolina in 1882, then in North Carolina in 1888-89, there were a lot of African Americans in those states who were saying, please reconsider. What if you get out there and you've basically been tricked or trapped? You won't have neighbors around you to help you. You might be sold into modern day slavery. Why would you separate yourself from any of your kin and do what slave traders did to us in, um, before emancipation? And so there was a lot of fear that destitute migrants would get out to Arkansas and be held in conditions that were essentially akin to slavery. And I will say we do have records of that. That was not a um, irrational fear. Uh, the great NAACP organizer, William Pickens was from a South Carolina family that migrated to Woodruff County. And through 
what appear to be fraudulent accounting practices, the landlord just tried to keep them in debt and keep them on that land forever. And they had to flee in the night and catch a train in the middle of the night and get to Little Rock to get out of that system. But it's also really important to be aware that many African Americans were taking careful steps to avoid debt slavery, that they were oftentimes organizing in church-based clubs, sending representatives to negotiate the contracts ahead of time, two to three literate men, often school teachers, and then they would come back, explain what they'd found, and migrants would either charter a train together or create a wagon train to move out west. So I want to really quickly wrap up because I want to have time for questions. We know that these positive conditions of African-American political leadership, um, modest integration, that that ended in Arkansas in 1891 with the passage of the first Jim Crow laws. Because of chain migration though, because there were already families in Arkansas saying, come migrate, we'll help you, you know, we'll connect you to a job it does not end African-American migration to Arkansas. In fact, conditions got so much worse in other parts of the South in the 1890s and the early 1900s that the overall rate of African-American migration to Arkansas actually continued to increase and didn't stop until World War I. One of the things you do see though is that after 1891, African-American migrants often are moving to places where they can be a lot like what Dr. Barnes talked about, surrounded by other Black people, um, oftentimes in Black towns. Migrants found I, roughly 30 communities in Arkansas, um, Edmondson, Menifee, which is really close to UCA. Um, Sweet Home is a, a combination of Native Arkansans and migrants in um, who homestead together, I could go on and on, but these places offer African-Americans an opportunity to maintain safety, control their schools and protect themselves as Jim Crow gets more and more violent. Um, I'd be happy to show you these. I'm just gonna quickly, these are some of the major politicians who were from uh, the Georgia migration of 1873. This is William Pickens who migrated to Arkansas from South Carolina in 1888. John Blunt or Blount who ran for governor in 1920 was part of the 1873 Georgia migration. The Alexander family of Tennessee, famous ragtime jazz musicians um, from West Tennessee. Mrs. Josephine Pankey who founded the Pankey settlement outside of Little Rock from um, a North Carolina family, and Carrie Still Shepherson, an Atlanta University graduate who founded um, the first African-American public library in Arkansas, also from Georgia. So I wanna end with a quote by Ida B. Wells, who I think she really helps us think about how to consider the migration to Arkansas. Um, in the middle of North Carolina's migration to Arkansas in 1889, those migrants were, be, migrants were being harshly criticized for being naive. And Miss Wells, who at that time was a newspaper editor in Memphis, was actually watching North Carolina migrants to Arkansas pass by her window. And she wrote, there is no land of milk and honey for us. Wherever we go, we will always work for a living and fight for our rights. So thank you. Awesome job story, awesome job. Thank you. Okay, we have a list of questions. I'll start with the first one. Uh, it says, uh, invaluable research, so important to continue. What resources can our state government and private foundations provide to support next research by other Arkansas students slash scholars, digitizing, indexing, and family data? by county town, digitization, auto interviews, connecting descendants to online conversations with Arkansas's new, cre new creating lesson plans for use in schools with the ADE help. 
that question is so beautiful. It almost answers itself, right? We, those are things that we need to have as goals. And to me, first of all, let me just share, if you want um, just a really short, most of my work is pretty easy to find, but um, there's one encyclopedia entry article I wanted to share with you guys, because it's a little bit harder to find. It's three pages long. And if you wanted to work with your students, I think this is short enough. I don't think most students want to read 40 pages on this. Um, but I will say, I don't have the answer to this, but to me, the story of African-American migration to Arkansas is so critically important for our students in schools. We, as a teacher of prospective elementary teachers, we focus a lot on what was it like in the quote unquote pioneer era when people made their own cloth, their soap, um, and that is often taught as a white story. When there is just wonderful information out there, for, many times from migrants talking about, you know, we didn't have much room, but my grandmother brought her spinning wheel. We brought our, you know, hunting dog and our gun because we were not going. We were going to hunt and not live off the landlord. So I think this is an age-appropriate story for younger elementary students to see African Americans as part of a pioneer culture that emphasized using the land to support yourself and, you know. I, not just the land, I think African-American migrants saw that as like, that's God's gifts to help you maintain your independence and protect your families. The other really beautiful thing I think that is being done is that the Arkansas State Archives are participating in the Library of Congress Chronicling America. And I'm gonna type it. Chronicling America Digitized Newspapers. This is the major source I used other than um, WPA interviews from the 1930s, which are also publicly available to learn about African-American migration to Arkansas. Now you have to be willing to work with students to read against the grain um, because sometimes it'll be a white newspaper that'll start by saying, you know, this ridiculous movement. But then once you get past the first paragraph, even the white newspapers will often get honest. Well, what did we expect after cheating and, you know, trying to steal from our tenants? Did anybody actually think it was going to turn out any different from this? So I think being able to, you could teach research skills and also learn the history of your community, because the super cool thing about this is every community has a different story. So you know, the Conway County story of migration from South Carolina, Georgia, and Tennessee, that's going to look really different from the Bisco area, low note, you know, Prairie County area story of migration from North Carolina. So just a beautiful opportunity to teach our students an, a hidden history of their own community. Next question was, where was the Freedom's Village located in Little Rock? Oh, man. If that person can send me their email, I have it somewhere. I finally figured it out over years, and I'm just blanking on it right now. So um, okay. I, I can get that information to you, but I don't know off the top of my head. Okay, the next question says, please tell us what became to the owners of the federal land that that was homesteaded by the African Americans in Arkansas. Did they continue as owners and pass the land to their children? Oh, so that's a very, very important story. Um, so we can see already at the end of the Civil War that Arkansas's land records were such a mess that several of the first African American um, communities founded in Arkansas actually had to move. There was one out in a place called Cherokee Prairie which was named for the Western Cherokee who had lived there. It's near, um, it's near Fort Smith and Van Buren. And they lived in their community for three years. And then basically the railroad company came along and said, oh, the land records were wrong. You all have to move. So that happened to several communities. And that really caused a lot of African-Americans to start just buying from the railroad because those records were always clear, e even though it cost a little bit of money. So. The homestead claims, we see a lot of different things happening. Some have been passed down. Um, you can go to uh, GLO, the Government Land Office, GLO, I think it's 
www.ncpa.gov. And you can look up, they have a database of everybody who made a claim and you can trace the land patent that way. Um, so yes, in some areas, the land has been passed down. In other areas, if you know anything about the story of white capping and expulsion in Arkansas, especially in the Arkansas River Valley, that these landowners were targeted oftentimes by white mobs and driven from their land. So I think there's a really important story there that I don't have all the answers to of what happened to all this black land that was owned and bought in the late 19th century. The next question, it's sort of like a trick question. You can answer it and give your best. It says, this is great informative research about black Arkansas. Why are the legislators trying to suppress documented research with bills 1218 and 1232? Yeah, so 1218 and 1232, I think are, um, to me, it, it shows perhaps a lack, a, a lot of hearing about how African-American history is taught, but um, the individuals who've authored those bills, to my mind, clearly haven't actually studied African-American history because it's so important. I mean, I'm a white person and to me, this is the most enriching history I studied on my state. I learned more about my people in Arkansas from studying quote unquote black history than I did from a standard textbook narrative. And so I think that we have to push back against, even though that bill has been amended, to permit African American history to be taught, well then what are we supposed to do? Am I just supposed to teach about the African Americans came and became landowners and then just not talk about land theft, violent white capping and expulsion? Because one of my students might consider that to be divisive. I think an honest reckoning with our history um, includes all emotions about that. It is a, a history that is as James Baldwin said, beautiful and terrifying. And if we can't have room for all of that uh, experience within our students and are prohibited from teaching our students anything that would make them feel uncomfortable, then um, we really can't study injustice. And that's a shame. Next one is who guided the wagon trains west, former soldiers? How did they get here on home? <gasps> Oh, that's a great question. So who guided the wagon trains west? And did, did I hear you say former soldiers? That was the question. Was it former soldiers or? Oftentimes, and oftentimes. And, and here, I mean, we need so much family research on this. I just want to encourage everyone to be publishing in, with the African-American Genealogical Society, with Arkansas Historical Quarterly, because this is where family history is critical. We know oftentimes that African-American soldiers were leaders in um, migration movements, oftentimes because they had a family member who'd been sold to Arkansas or had been separated from a family member during the Civil War. So that was something I didn't talk that much about, but a lot of early migrants are trying to find a wife, children, people who've been sold away. And African-American soldiers had often gained um, literacy or already had literacy skills before they went into the military and having done a lot of that traveling, they do have a lot of experience with that. But you also do see elders who are women leading these wagon trains. Um, I don't know that there was a, always a leader, but you do often see basically the grandmothers of the community um, making decisions about we're going to settle here and here's where we're going to go and why. Next question. What was the timeline of immigration from Georgia to Arkansas? Um, so there are a couple of big migrations out of Georgia, uh, big movements that made statements to the press, had county captains and so forth. One was 1873, 1874. But there was another one after a lynching, um, and I'm just blanking on the community right now. It was at the same time as Barnwell, but I'm not going to remember. And that was 1889, 1890. But then in between those two movements, there's always chain migration um, happening every single year with people going out to meet family members who'd already migrated. Okay. 
uh, how were so many African Americans dispositioned off their property in Arkansas? Have there been any studies of this disposition or book on the subject? Mm -hmm. You know, I hope that there is research being done right now, and we really need someone who has the skills of like a forensic accountant to go in because the story is really important, but it's going to take looking. I think the story we know is the violent one because that shows up in the newspapers, but I actually think the more common story is um, manipulation of property taxes and property tax records, and that is going to take that sort of forensic looking through the accounts and tracing. Also, a lot of county records are gone, so it won't be possible to reconstruct that for every single county. But um, just anecdotally from talking to other researchers, it seems like manipulation of property tax records is a big piece of dispossessing African Americans from their land. Next question. It took two years for my great grandparents to migrate here from South Carolina, is this uh, unusual? That is highly usual. So I feel like the stereotype of migration to Arkansas is that migrants end up here in a lot of debt from train tickets they couldn't afford and they let the landlord pay for them. That does happen, but what's actually far more common is the story that you've just related, which is African-Americans migrating on foot, even stopping to farm one share crop in a county, in a state along the way, and then continuing on because of the horror at being in debt to white folks. You know, most migrants, one of their main goals is to not ever have to rely on a white employer for credit again. So slow migration is very typical. Uh, and somebody commented earlier uh, that John Jennifer he was one of our pastors at the Bethel A in the church, 17th and stayed in Little Rock. That's wonderful. I love hearing that. So Bethel was a big defender of Arkansans because so many um, missionaries who came here in the early 1870s were just like, oh, they're so wild. They don't go to church. It's just heathens out here. And Jennifer was like, calm down, calm down. You know, we have churches and institutions and houses just like everybody else that, you know, it, and if you're concerned, he would say, that just means we need more laborers in the vineyard. If you're so worried about their morals, come on out and help us. So he was wonderful. And somebody commented, my great grandparents stopped to share crop and wait for the rivers to recede during their migration. Oh, that is just, that information is just gold and it yeah I think we so need a children's book on this and I think so many I know my eight-year-old would definitely be into a book about this huge adventure that people um, went on with their families you know oftentimes with I see these mothers who are going on this adventure with 14 children and you just think of the bravery and the resourcefulness it took to do that kind of migration with the big family is there any more questions? I don't see any more questions in. In the uh, chat. Okay. So I'll conclude by saying I'd love to help any teachers out there. You're welcome to email me. That's why I put my email up. Um, and I'll just put it in the chat. If you ever want to organize, especially over the summer, um, study of your community, please be in touch with me because I love to share records and get you started on um, researching this history with your students. 